Good afternoon. Really glad to be here with you today and looking forward to this time together. And let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this uh, chance to get together and be encouraged by one another to worship you as we've done, to hear the testimonies, life stories, life-changing stories because of your marvelous work in the lives of your children. Lord, we ask that you open up our hearts and minds to receive your word today. Change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to look at James today, uh, chapter 5. You know, I've often started a Bible study. I think I've taught James three times or so in my life as a pastor. And every time I tell the members of my Bible study, hey, we're going to start James, they always go, oh. You know, because James begins by saying, consider it pure joy when you face all kinds of problems. And everybody goes, yeah, right, James. Yeah, but we're not going to study the first chapter, but we're going to go to chapter 5, and we are going to talk about trouble today. James chapter 5, you know, talks about trouble. How many of you here have ever had trouble in their lives? I don't see any hands going up. Oh, one, two, three, a few, huh? Okay. The rest of you, you can go home now. (laughs) For those of you who've had trouble... How many of you, once you got over that troublesome thing in your life, you were scot-free? There was no more trouble coming. Anybody? Oh, no. There's more right around the corner? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been there, too. You know, we like the promises of the Bible, don't we? we? We just love all the promises of the Bible. Well, Jesus gave us one that, you know, we don't really like to hang on too much but Jesus said in John chapter 16 we don't have to go there but Jesus said in this world you will have trouble he didn't say you might maybe some of you will so of those of you who haven't had any yet get ready because it's right around the corner let's read James chapter 5 verses 13 through 18 Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other And pray for each other, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. That's from the NIV. Yeah. It's kind of awkward doing this. I'm in into a whole completely different area here. I need a desk, I think. Oh, now my calendar's opening up. There it is. Okay. There was a little boy who was really looking forward to going to his friend's birthday party. And just a couple of days before the party was to take place, a blizzard came through, and it was really snowing in the neighborhood. And his friend lived just down the street. It wasn't too far away. But his dad said, uh-uh, you're not going even just down the street, not in, this, not in these conditions. But, Dad, all the other kids in the neighborhood will be there. I just know they will be. Come on, Dad, let me go. Their parents are letting them go. You ever heard that before? Yeah, my mom and dad were just like that. 
Then dad finally said, all right, you can go. Surprised, but overjoyed, the little boy said, got his jacket on, got his galoshes on. Everybody, anybody know what galoshes are? Yeah. He plunged into that raging storm, got out in front of his house, turned left. Wow. Driving snow made it almost impossible for him to move. He could barely see, but finally he managed to get there. As he rang the doorbell, he felt kind of funny, so he turned around to look, and just running out into the snow was the figure of a man that looked just like his dad. So his dad had actually just followed him all the way to his friend's house to make sure he got there safely. Isn't that a picture of what God does to us? He doesn't try to keep us away from go from the things that will... Yeah, he was kind of behind him, you know, it's snowing a lot, so he couldn't really see him. So. So, uh, your parents will take you out into the snow and let you play like that. So. God cares for us, and he lets us go out into situations that might be troublesome to us, but he's right behind us, supporting us all the way, making sure we're getting there safely. Today's passage in James really speaks, I think, about how God cares for us. We read that James asks the question, is anyone among you in trouble? I think this talks about all kinds of trouble. I've had various kinds of trouble in my life. But what does James talk about here in trouble? The New Testament, one New Testament Greek dictionary says that trouble here in this passage means, it could mean physical pain, it could mean hardship, it could mean stress. I think it means all of them. And uh, I think the young congregation that James was talking to was going through this. I think it's emotional pain that comes from physical pain, difficult relationships, and maybe the exhaustion that comes from all those hard times that we have to go through. I was working on this sermon last week, and then I came into the English service at the end of the service, and then just for fellowship, and Chris and Fernando and I were sitting around talking about raising children. And Fernando and I were grinning as Chris was going, man, Kevin, you and Fernando got to pray for me. Man, my kids. I was going, oh, having a little trouble there, huh? You know, have, uh, you've ever watched Bill Cosby's video about raising kids? You know, his, uh, his answer to what's wrong with children is that they're all brain damaged. And that's why they give him so much trouble. And we were saying, yeah, Chris, we'll pray for you because we've actually gone through it. And uh, they just have so much energy. And we have to try to keep up with them. And we have to try to debate with them. And we want to win the debate all the time. And we think we can. And it's exhausting. It really is exhausting. And that's one of the kinds of trouble that we have is dealing with children and children dealing with parents. And it can be exhausting. And that's trouble. Mark Twain said, my mother had a great deal of trouble with me, but I really think she enjoyed it. I'm not sure about that. And, you know, Bill Cosby did say, I brought you into this world and I can take you out of it. My mother actually said that to me. So I, I don't know. She, she just really had a lot of trouble with me. And, you know, I still have my face, but she, she tried to slap it off of me a few times. There is trouble that comes to us naturally, like that of being a parent, like that of being a teacher, like that of being an employee, like that of being a spouse. Things happen in life, and we face trouble, and it wears on us, and we will get tired. Even as time goes on, we don't see the problems being solved, and it's frustrating, and, and we get stressed out, and we feel like we're depressed. When I was younger, we thought of depression as just, hey, I'm having a bad day. And we did have bad days, and that was the trouble that we were going through. But I believe that some of the troubles that we face are 
from our own doing, when we don't seem to want to follow God as we should, when we don't want to open up his word as we should, when we don't want to spend time as prayer, in prayer as we should, when we begin to avoid fellowship and don't have the support of those around us, and we begin to slow down in our spiritual walk and maybe even go a little bit backwards in our spiritual walk. And there's that kind of trouble as well. So we face a lot of things that can give us trouble and lead to stress. Well, God has a problem, uh, an answer. God has a solution to our problem with stress, and that is to pray. James said, Is any, any among you in trouble? Let them pray. Let them pray. We had our Thanksgiving serve, uh, dinner at our home the other day and uh, on Thursday night, and my son and his daughter, uh, his wife, his wife came, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, and some friends came. And we we have a custom in our home is before you get to eat, you have to give thanks. I mean, it's Thanksgiving, so you don't eat if you don't give thanks. And so I got around the table, and I didn't want to give thanks. You know, after everybody had such great thankful things, and I just said, well, I'm thankful for people who prayed for me in this past year because there were days when I didn't feel like praying. And that's good when you have somebody to pray for you when you're in trouble and you really don't feel like it at the time. There could be those times when you're, you're just down or work's really bothering you or, you know, things can happen. You're missing home. But James tells us, if you're in trouble, you pray. You pray. It's good to have people praying for you, but we have a responsibility as a believer to pray when we're in trouble. The part that I don't like is that, you know, when we pray and the trouble goes away, again, there's another one waiting around the corner for us. But E.M. Bounds wrote a great book on prayer, and he said this in that book. He said, trouble and prayer are closely related to one another. Prayer is of great value to trouble. Trouble often drives men to God in prayer, while prayer is but the voice of men in trouble. There is great value in prayer in the time of trouble. Prayer often delivers us out of trouble and still more often gives strength to bear trouble. Ministers comfort in trouble and begets patience in the midst of trouble. Wise is the person in the day of trouble who knows his true source of strength and fails not to pray. So we must pray. If you don't feel like it, pray anyway. Pray anyway. If you can make it to a computer to type an email, pick up your phone and call a friend to pray, that's good. But don't fail to pray. James is not alone in this solution to our troubles. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Sorry for my hands in my pocket. I mean, usually I have a pulpit to hang on but I'm not just being super casual. It's just, what else do you do up here? You have a guitar. <laughs> Midori and I actually went to a church in our college days where the pastor preached with a guitar because he didn't have a pulpit. We preached. We had a hotel lobby that we, uh, we rented a hotel space, so he would. He had his guitar. <laughs> he was that afraid of the crowd. So. Good pastor, though. Except for that guitar. He played it too, though. Luke chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So seek his kingdom. How do you do that? By prayer. Go to God in prayer. Find out what he's trying to give you what he wants to give you. He knows what you have need of. And meet with God there. And let's go to another passage, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. We always love when Paul encourages us from Philippians, knowing that he was probably in prison when he wrote this. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Let me read that again. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the result of that will be the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Pretty encouraging, huh? Or tattoo that on your hand. Yeah? Yep, okay. I'm stressed. There it is. Don't stress about it. Pray about it. Don't stress about it. Pray about it. And then James's next question in the same pet series of verses. Is anybody happy? It's sometimes overlooked when we are excited about living a good life. Sometimes we go through a series, a little time period where we're not facing all kinds of trials. We're not facing a whole load of problems. It's very, you know, if you if you do that often, I want you to tell me how you're managing that later after the service, because it seems like I, you know, troubles follows me around. But there are times when we are really filled with joy, and there are times when we don't have all those trials. Even if it's a short time, God wants us to not forget who He is. If anybody is happy, let him sing. Let's not overlook the fact that we should praise God when we're happy. We come to church and we have great worship leaders and it's fun to it's fun and you know it gets us in the mood to receive God's word. But when we're alone, when we're by ourselves and things seem to be going well, make sure you take time to praise God. People have a tendency that when things are not going so well, we are quick to go to God and say, God, what's going on here? Help! But how about when things are going well? Do we remember to praise God? Do we remember to be thankful? Or is it just during those stressful times? It would do us good to remember that God is the one responsible for the blessings in our lives. It would do us good to remember that God is the one who is responsible for responsible for the blessings in our lives. I know that I'm very quick to complain when things are not going my way, when things are not going well for me. I would love to be able to be as quickly, as quick to praise Him as I am to complain to Him. When things are going well, I want to praise Him. And I think that's what James was saying here. If anybody's happy, don't just sit around. Sing. 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 You know, I have, a, I have a voice like you, Kevin. I shouldn't sing. You know. Get, go somewhere. Take a walk in the woods and sing. <laughs> sing. Sing quietly. If we are blessed enough to be hang, happy, we should thank God by singing praises to him. When our praises are directed to God, I think singing is a kind of prayer, kind of way to pray, isn't it? I think... My wife has told me a couple of times, man, you got to come to church when Adam's leaving worship. You haven't seen him leave worship yet. I, I suggest that you, you concentrate on worship when Adam's leading. But when you look at Adam's face, Adam is praying when he is singing worship songs. I don't know if he notices if you guys are out there or not. Because he is focused on God. I, see, I saw that today, and I appreciate your leading worship. And that song you wrote was, woo. Mm, very good. Prayer. Songs of praise. When you praise God, when God is blessing you, you praise Him. And prayer, praise is a form of prayer, I think. Let's go on to the next one. Do not forget to thank God when you're happy, because He is the reason you are smiling. James asks another question. Is any among you sick? Is any among you sick? One of the characteristics of the early church, we can read the New Testament, is that they prayed for the sick. They were careful to take care of their own. Of course, they didn't have the hospitals, they didn't have the clinics, they didn't have the insurance, they didn't have all those things that we have today. But still, I don't think that means that we are not responsible, are responsible to pray for one another. James says, is, anyone, is any among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Where does the responsibility lie here? Where does the responsibility lie? 
Is any among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church. The sick person. Okay, little Emily can't, we know, but as an adult, if you're not feeling well, send your pastor an email. Call your pastor. Call the elders. Somebody you know that's a little more uh, mature in the Lord, maybe. Give them a call. Send them an email. Say, hey, I am really not doing well. I need you to pray for me. It lies with the sick person to call the elders of the church. The Holy Spirit generally doesn't tap me and Pastor Chris and Pastor Hiroshi on the shoulder and tell us, hey, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one has a cold. And so get on your knees right now. I mean, God does prompt us on occasion to know when to pray. And we do look at Facebook once in a while and see when, you know, Kazumasa has got a you know, bronchitis. We, we do see that, but... I think God wants the person who is sick to take a step in faith and say, I'm going to go to the leaders of my church. God's established the church this way. God's built the church this way. I'm going to go to my spiritual leaders and have them pray for me. So if you want God's healing, let somebody in the church know so they can pray for you. We've got to do it God's way. And we'll be glad to, to do that. What's the thing with the oil? Well, anointing was often used in the early church for you know, praying for people for healing. In scriptures, we know that uh, oil was used as both medicinally. Um, we read the, the story of the Good Samaritan where, you know, the, the traveler was uh, beat up by robbers and thieves. And, and then the guy came along, the Good Samaritan came along and anointed his wounds with oil. And so it was medicinally used, but it's also a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, in, in the Old Testament, priests and prophets and kings were anointed with oil. So it symbolizes God's presence. So if you want to pray for somebody to be healed, it wouldn't be bad for you to take a little olive oil and put it on their forehead uh, and pray for them. It wouldn't be bad. I have a funny story. We had some friends who were moving, and their son was having a lot of trouble with his eyes when they were moving. So... He asked me, and he's a, he's a pastor as well, and he and another friend were there, and they had just about everything packed up into their house, into boxes and read out of their house. And he said, Kevin, you know, since you're kind of of that persuasion, can you pay, pray for my son? You know, I mean, I don't, my church doesn't do that too often. And I said, well, Scott, you're real serious about this? He said, yeah, I mean, just, his eyes are just driving me crazy, you know, and he's just suffering. I said, well, you got some oil? And he said, well, we packed everything up. We've got spam. We've got Pam. Pam. You know, the spray oil? I said, okay, give me that. And we sprayed that on my hands, and while I was rubbing it together, my friends were laughing so hard they couldn't pray anymore, you know. I've never seen anybody pray for somebody with Pam. And I said, what's going to happen now? And we prayed for his son. I don't know what happened the next day? Maybe he had a greasy face. I know that. But, but yeah, there's nothing special about the oil. Nothing special at all. Once the prayer begins, the, the person who's sick, right, they have the responsibility to go to the elders of the church. And then when the elders begin to pray, they pray the prayer of faith. That's the key. Trusting God, asking God to do something very special. And God does the healing. The elders don't heal. The oil doesn't heal. God heals. We go to God in faith. The sick person has faith to ask the leaders of the church to pray. The elders ask God in faith to heal. So as any of you sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them. And God will lift them up. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. There's some pretty definitive uh, words there. When does God do this? How does God do this? Why doesn't he do it all the time? I wish I knew. I wish I had the answers. Uh, We've prayed and prayed uh, our own story. My wife had a a cyst in her hand for uh, over a year. And, you know, every time she'd do some housework or lift a book or anything, it was very painful. And we went to a Christian doctor We prayed for months and months and months, and 
Uh, we did some medical things like drawing the fluid out of the cyst, and, you know, it came back, and uh, she had a lot of tears because of the pain. And uh, we had to go see the doctor the next day, and we were thinking about surgery and getting a scar on her hand. And, well, okay, Midori, let's pray one more time. And, you know, I got classes tomorrow. I've got to go to bed, you know, and we prayed one more time. And about 5 in the morning, Midori, Kevin, get up, get up, wake up. And she did like this. And it was just as smooth and clean as could be and gone. Never came back again. So I don't know about the timing thing. We just leave that up to God. We ask God in faith to heal the sick. It's scripture. It's right here in the New Testament. We need to do it. We need to trust God that he will somehow do this. And in his timing, we have to trust in faith that he knows best to do this. You know, this, this prayer of faith here talked about, when, when we see the word heal in the New Testament, it's the word, it also can be translated as save. It's the word sozo in Greek. And it means heal or save. Either way is fine. But it depends on the context as how it's translated. The word means to cause someone to become well again after having been sick. And it also means a spiritually sick as well. So it's the same word. Uh, divine healing, as we, can, we read the New Testament, it happened through the New Testament. Um, you know, this is an Assemblies of God church, and I've heard Pastor Chris mention it uh, before. Uh, one of our bylaws is that we believe that divine healing is, is part of what uh, Christ did on the cross. Um, if we look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, uh, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We are healed. And in, in the Hebrew, the, the word is healed. It's not saved. Although it's, it's, it's in there because it's talking about uh, a complete restoration. But this is definitely healing that Jesus brought to us. And it's one of the messianic prophecies. And, and evidence that he was the Messiah. So to say that this verse doesn't mean healing would say Jesus is not the Messiah. He says the Messiah would bring healing. And that's what people say. Oh, all these people getting healed here. He must be the Messiah. And Jesus did that when he came. And James says, the Lord shall raise them up. Again, not the person praying, not the anointing, God doing the work. We love this verse. Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. If he healed 2,000 years ago, if he loved and cared for those people to heal them those, in those days, he will heal us as well when we pray. And then James also goes on to say um, that we are to confess our faults to one another. We have to be careful about this one, I think. You know. God is deeply concerned about our physical needs but he's more concerned about our spiritual needs. And one of the things James says to us is that we are to confess our sins to one another. That's kind of hard, isn't it? It's kind of hard to talk to your, you know, it's easy to tell God what your faults are. You know, easy to confess. You know, and as a Catholic, I was glad to go into the confessional and say, okay, and, you know, I couldn't see the, his face and he couldn't see my face, so I would confess to the priest you know, and some of the things I was kind of softening up a lot, but, you know, I, I would go in there and do that. But sometimes we need to get together with brothers and sisters and say, hey, look, I'm struggling with this thing. And I think that's what James is saying here. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Healed emotionally, I think, is an important concept that we need to look at here. If there's something inside of you that you've been holding in and you really need to tell somebody, then, then find a brother or a sister that you can trust and go to them and confess that thing to them. And you will find an unbelievable lifting of that burden that's been dragging you down for the longest. You can find somebody here that you can trust and talk to, I'm sure. And it'll do a wonderful thing. I, I found this in a, a commentary. A mutual concern for one another is one way to combat discouragement and downfall. 
The cure is in personal confession and prayerful concern. Let me read it again since I see somebody writing it down. A mutual concern for one another is the way to combat discouragement and downfall. The cure is in personal confession and prayerful concern. As we show our concern for each other, it really serves to bring healing. If you know that somebody's praying for you and somebody cares about you and they're telling you, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, how are you doing? A healing begins to take place. It's the way God has set us up. So confessing does two things. It, we're find, we find out when we sit with somebody and confess with them that we're not the only ones struggling with certain sins, don't we? We find that out. And if we share someone with someone what we're struggling with and they've already been through it, it really makes us feel like, wow, maybe I can get some answers here. Maybe somebody can help me to get through this. So, you know, long ago before psychologists were, you know, working this out, James had already written it down. The Holy Spirit had said, tell my kids to confess to one another and it will do great things for them. Now, now that I told you to confess your faults to one another, I have a little funny story that maybe will make you think twice about it. Four preachers were <clears throat> meeting for a little friendly gathering, maybe at Starbucks or someplace like that. During the conversation, one, one of the preachers said, you know, our people come to us and pour out their hearts. They confess certain sins and needs. Why don't we do the same thing? And the pastors kind of sat back and went, wait a minute. Confess? I mean, you know, uh, you know, it's not that easy, you know. Okay. After a cup of coffee, maybe the second cup, they decided, okay, we'll, we'll do it. So the first pastor said, you know, I really like to watch Dr. House. Those DVDs, you know, I, I go in my bedroom and my wife thinks I'm praying and reading the Bible and I'm watching Dr. House over and over again. I'm an addict. I just can't stop. I've got a collection of DVDs. And the other guys go, okay, well, it's not bad, but if it's taking all your prayer time and Bible time, then okay. Second guy said, I love to dream about owning an expensive sports car. I have pamphlets. I go online and I look at those Audis beamers and it's just you know that's what I'm doing instead of studying for my sermon on Sunday <laughs> dreaming about that sports car I may never own but really want one I lust after cars third guy says well that's pretty bad hmm okay my turn I confess I like to do a little gambling and here I am in Japan you know I don't go to the casino or thing Anything but pachinko. I slip in there with a big hat over my eyes. You know, and I do a little pachinko once in a while. I never win anything, but it drives me crazy. And I hope nobody from the church ever sees me. And then it was time for the fourth pastor to go. And he just sat there. Nope. I want to. Come on, we all confessed. Come on, it's your turn. He said, I can't. You guys will hate me. Oh, come on. Okay. My weakness is gossip, and I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> but still, please. It's a story. <laughs> Confession's good for you. I'm sure those three pastors felt good for a while. Right. We have to pray for one another. It's not just the pastors who you can confess to, but your brothers and sisters. There are brothers and sisters here who really want to support you, really care about your needs. If you have something that you need to talk to somebody about, get online. You know, we have great ways to communicate these days. And it's so readily available to you. Somebody in this community, our community is small, but... And these are a group of caring people here, as Alex mentioned. We have 
been told by many, many people who have gone back to America and Europe and Australia and New Zealand how much they miss Mitaki and the close fellowship that's developed here. It's something special, and God brings us here maybe for a, a very special reason. Not maybe. I know he brings us here for a very special reason. And then he sends us back for a special reason too. But um, get together with your brothers and sisters and confess. And I'm sure they won't gossip about you. Okay. So we talked about um, many, many different things. When you know, God cares about our emotional needs, the first one we mentioned, trouble, form of stress, depression. God cares about our physical needs. If you're sick, God wants to heal you. God mostly cares about your spiritual needs, though. When you have a need as a Christian, maybe you're not a believer yet, God wants to come into your life and change you. But as a believer, if you're not walking the way God wants you to walk, you can go to God and pray and have others pray for you, and God will bring you to the place that he wants you to be. James says that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Well, Kevin, who can do that? Now, am I righteous? You know, that was, that was talking about a righteous person. You know, in, in our bulletin today, we've got Elijah. You know, read your bulletin, the story about Elijah. Now, he was a righteous guy, right? And he could pray, but I'm not anything like Elijah. Can I pray? Are we righteous enough to pray that way? Can we ask God? Well, no, we're not, none of us are righteous enough. It's Jesus Christ who is in us who is righteous. So, yes, we are righteous men and women because of our standing in Jesus Christ. So we can pray. And that's what James is telling us. You guys can pray. God wants us to pray. God wants us to sing. God wants us to trust in his word. Let me read in conclusion. Let me read from James Again, chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, but I'm going to read it in the message. And I just want you to listen to what the message says. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the Master. Believing prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sinned, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human just like us, prayed hard that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. Not a drop for three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed that it would rain, and it did. The showers came, and everything started growing again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you even for the book of James. Sometimes the lessons in your word are very hard, but they're always good. They're always good. Father, let us come to you, Lord, whether we feel like it or not whether we feel like it emotionally or not, whether we feel like it physically or not, whether we feel like it especially spiritually or not, let us come to you in prayer. Let us go to a brother or sister or pastor, church leader, worship leader. Let let us ask them to share our burdens. Father, we know that you will lift us up. You will heal us. Whether that's an emotional healing, a physical healing, or a spiritual healing, we we know and we believe that you will do the work in us. It's not us. 
It's not the power of the, the pastor or the worship leaders, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. You will lift us up. We believe your promises today. Father, we just ask that you would bless your word in the ears and the hearts of all who listen today. In Jesus' name, amen.